Great. Well, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, first, let me introduce myself. I am Alexis Taylor. I'm Deputy Undersecretary of the Farm and Foreign Agricultural Services at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, but more importantly than my fancy title that I have, <laughs> um, I grew up on a farm in Iowa, so I come from strong agricultural roots. It's been in my family for 150 years, uh, but also a veteran. I served eight years in the military, um, in the Army, much of that time in the reserves, uh, but also with a tour to Iraq. Um, before we get started really to the reason why we're here today, I would just uh, kind of like to take a personal note on sorry, yeah. whoo, how proud I am of the department and the work that we're doing here. Um, and more importantly, how proud I am to have someone like Deputy Secretary Hardin lead this effort. Um, she is a wonderful advocate for veterans in agriculture and just a role model, a leader in the department, and someone I consider a personal a friend and someone who we are so lucky to have as veterans um, transi transitioning from the military to agriculture. Um, I'll introduce our panel briefly. Uh, for, um, first we've got Dave Pollock, owner of Sassafras Creek Farms from Maryland. Karen and Colin Archiplay, co-founders of Archie's Acres in California. Marianne Cofone, executive director of Recirculating Farms in Louisiana and Justin Barclay, Veteran Farming Program Coordinator for Rodale Institute in Pennsylvania. Um, every year we've got approximately 200,000 service members m like myself, like Dave, like Colin, uh, transitioning for, um, through the Transition Assistance Program from DOD from military life to civilian life. Earlier this week the deputy uh, announced or she visited a Transition Assistance Program class to announce the integration of agriculture into that career training and counseling. Um, really programs, that's the programs that service members are, are utilizing. Today we have a panel of veteran farmers and um, veteran trading organizations who are looking at long-term careers in farming, ranching, and agriculture, and the opportunities that they hold um, and how USDA can fit into those. Just want to remind everyone out there watching to please share your questions or feedback via Twitter or submit info via the G Plus, or, yeah, G Plus event page. Uh, Twitter, YouTube, or Facebook uh, using hashtag NextGenAg. That's hashtag NextGenAg. Before we hear to our panel, I'd like to turn over to, as I said, the woman I consider a mentor, role model, and friend, uh, Deputy Secretary Hardin. Thank you very much, Alexis, and thanks to our panelists. And I appreciate Alexis' kind words, but really, I'm just a, you know one of the people uh, at USDA who cares so deeply about this agenda, about this effort about making sure that those who have served our country so well and so bravely um, and who are interested and think they might be interested in careers in agriculture. I like Alexis grew up on a farm and my um, mom was in Georgia, not in Iowa, um, but I know how the land heals. I know the difference it can make in someone's life um, and just have that passion. I want to make sure that anybody else interested in a career in farming or ranching understands that USDA is in your corner. We want to help you continue your service uh, by, by growing food um, for our country and for others. Um, the average age of the American farm is 58. So we're out there talking and recruiting ourselves um, for that next generation and it can easily be um, someone who's had military service. You understand hard work. We know that. You know you're going to work till the job's done. This is not a nine to five kind of job and you learn that in your training and Agriculture is just a great skill, I think. And some of you have told me, hey, I want my own business. Um, I've been following orders for a long time, and I'd like to be my own boss. And I think there are just so many things about agriculture, both in farming and ranching, that really tie very nicely with the skill sets, the leadership skills, the discipline that you have had that's required to be successful in agriculture. So we're going to talk about that today. We're going to hear from our panelists who have some firsthand experience and hopefully be able to answer some questions. Great. Well, thank you for that, Deputy. Uh, now I will turn it over to each of our panelists for a brief uh, introduction of themselves and some remarks. Uh, we'll start up with Dave. Hey, good morning, and thank you for inviting me. And um, also, Deputy, thank you very much for putting um, programs in place for both veterans and new farmers. I sincerely believe those are making a difference. Um, I'm Dave Polk. As I mentioned earlier, I'm a little bit different perhaps in that I'm not a returning veteran. I'm a career veteran. I served 25 years in the United States Navy. Um, I'm a full-time farmer now. I retired five years ago. My wife and I started a small organic vegetable farm in southern Maryland, about 45 miles south of Washington, D.C. And um, 
maybe unlike you two there in USDA, I, my wife or myself and many other new farmers I know, we do not come from ag backgrounds. But um, we felt a calling to do that, more just to let, nevertheless. And um, but we were suburbanites. But we had vegetable gardens as kids growing up. And now throughout my military career, we moved from duty station to duty station. We often had a small vegetable garden. And there, you mentioned earlier about a healing quality. There's something just about being in the soil and growing something and producing something. And um, our story is such that. We got involved with that, and as I was looking to retire from the military, moving on to my next career, I, I really started to look to farming as a way to sort of, uh, for lifestyle and I would say ideological reasons, objectives like that. And those are quite simply just to make a difference. I know it sounds a little bit corny, but after a long service in the military of service, you sort of come out of that organization and you say, I, I still feel like a need, I want to participate. And I want to, in my case, put down roots in the community and can do to provide you know, service to my community. And we also wanted to be self-employed. I wanted to do creative work. I wanted to serve my local community. And I also wanted to be part of what I see is an increasingly small scale of sustainable farming movement across the country uh, and provide opportunities for young people in particular on our farm so they can learn those skills and continue to provide local fresh produce to our local communities. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. Uh those remarks, Dave, I appreciate it. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Karen and Colin. Hey, good morning, and thanks for uh, allowing us to be a part of this. Um, you know, I would like to say as well as uh, Dave and the others that we've been working with the USDA, or the USDA has been working with us for many years, and it's, uh, we wouldn't be where we're at today without the assistance of the USDA, that's for sure. Um, Archie's Acres is a, a small-scale farm here in San Diego County. We grow primarily in greenhouses. We have some avocados and stuff that we service to uh, uh, you know, Whole Foods, National Food Retailers, and so forth. Um, we also created a program called a Better Stand by Culture Training Program, um, and it's now in partnership with, with Cal Poly. And the idea is we wanted to stay with the military community in some capacity, and we created kind of entrepreneurial incubators uh, focused in agriculture to help transition veterans and active duty service members into the ag field. Um, and uh, what should I add to that, Karen? Well, we've been teaching at the at the transition assistance program for over seven years, and it's been such an honor to meet so many people that that are really ready for agriculture as a career. They're ready for a change in environment and to be able to pull together with their family. Agriculture is such a family. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a huge lifestyle. I think that's why it would attracted us, but. Um... Like, like Dave was saying, we didn't have an agricultural background at all, but I did grow up in a rural community, so my days were spent outside, playing in the woods, um, and that's one of the reasons why I joined um, the Marine Corps, because I wanted to be outside and, uh, and do that stuff, and so transitioning into the agriculture was, was a perfect fit, not wanting to be at a desk job, not wanting to be something that was super customer intensive, uh, being able to work with my hands, I'm a physical activity type of person, so the lifestyle and all those other factors was, was a great fit, and I think... That's probably true with a lot of uh, military or service members. Excellent. Thank you for that, Colin and Karen. Uh, next up, I believe we've got uh, Marianne. Hey, good morning. Thank you so much for this. I think it's wonderful. Uh, I'm not a vet myself, as you all know, but uh, I did work for the U.S. Army as a civilian many years ago, and uh, that gained an interest and a great respect for those who serve our country through the military. Uh, today, I'm the executive director of the Recirculating Farms Coalition. We're a nonprofit organization headquartered in New Orleans, Louisiana. We work nationwide to support farms and farmers using water based growing technologies, so uh, as their primary means of production, along with soil based growing. So that means aquaculture, hydroponics, aquaponics, where fish or plants or fish and plants are raised in the system that recycle and reuse water and waste. Um, in New Orleans, we have both a community garden where we teach classes and do demonstrations, uh, and people grow food in their own raised garden beds. And we also host a market farm where we grow food for sale at lower rates to the community to provide better uh, healthy food access. Um, we're working with veterans in uh, a number of ways. Uh, first, through our new and beginner farming program sponsored by USDA. Uh, we offer trainings uh, specifically targeted to underserved communities, women, and veterans. And uh, we do this to start or improve 
uh, and expand existing operations or start new um, farming operations. We currently work closely with two vets through that program um, in a heightened capacity. One is creating her own garden for other veterans to come and learn farming, and the other is working with uh, inner city at-risk youth. And so we're supporting both of them in creating recirculating farm systems in their own growing spaces. And then additionally, we offer a special vets program um, in recirculating water-based farming. Um, we're, uh, we're teaching them um, to specifically use these new techniques. We learned that uh, growing methods like water-based growing are especially useful uh, for senior or disabled vets in particular because they're very versatile in design and uh, so they inspire creativity. Uh, they can be inside or outdoors, and so they offer flexibility. Um, growing food often leads to healthier eating and socializing, and in terms of physical requirements, these systems are usually vertical and uh, or elevated, and so they don't require much bending, and there's no weeding, so um, we've learned that these are really great systems for a whole range of veterans. Um, so if there's any vets out there that are interested in water-based growing or water-based growing in conjunction with uh, soil-based growing, get in touch with us. Great. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, last but certainly not least is Justin. Hello. Uh, my name is Justin Barclay. I'm the Veteran Farming Program Coordinator at the Rodale Institute. Again, I'd like to thank the Deputy Secretary and the Undersecretary for this opportunity to talk. Uh, like several others have already mentioned, you know, I, I'm a military veteran myself. I spent just over 10 years in the United States Army with uh, most of my time spent in Germany. Uh, when I immediately left the Army, I picked up a couple of different uh, defense contracting, you know, gigs, and then I was recalled. Uh, I spent a, a tour in Afghanistan, returned, did a few more defense contracting gigs, and just really wanted to kind of switch over to a different career field. Uh, I also did not grow up on a farm. I'm a typical suburban kid. But, you know, this was something that I kind of felt passionate about. And when I relocated back to, to Pennsylvania, my wife and I purchased a small horse farm. So that's kind of my initial connection into, into agriculture. But the opportunity that I was afforded to work here at Rodale, I was able to still have that attachment and still work with, with a lot of veterans. So it was kind of a, the best of both worlds because working with vets was pretty much all I knew for my entire adult life from, you know, age 18 up until present. So this allowed me to still keep that pulse on, you know, the veteran and the military community while also transitioning over to, to my other career field. Now, one of the main programs that we have with Rodale Institute is a partnership with a Delaware Valley University where we have our organic farming program, or organic farming certificate program. Uh, the program is open to, to all interested parties, but it so far has been a very attractive option for, for veterans because they're able to use their GI Bill to cover their tuition costs, they're able to get the housing stipend. Uh, altogether, it's a, it's a one-year program. They spend two semesters at DelVal and the summer semester up here at Rodale Institute where, you know, we're, our big focus is on organic farming, which, you know, several other, years, several other people have already mentioned about sustainable and, and organic focus. So that's definitely something, you know, we like to support. I'm also working on some other uh, internship initiatives as well here at Rodale Institute because some veterans have come back and said they want to learn about organic farming, but you know they may be a little bit older and you know 45 or 50, and they already have a couple degrees, and they say they don't want to go back to college, you know, to hang out with basically their children because that's how old their children tend to be, and they want to have a program that's on the farm. So we're also working on some internship-focused programs to address all the needs of veterans that, that we come across here at Rodale. Wow, that's great. Thanks, Justin. Um, thanks to all of our panelists for that brief overview. That was excellent. Uh, first, I'd like to say to Dave, Colin, and uh, Colin and Justin, thank you for your service. Uh, also, thank you to all the servicemen and women out there who are uh, either watching this uh, uh, Google Chat live or um, who are going to watch it recorded later on. We really appreciate that. But there is also different types of service as well. Um, as Marianne mentioned, she worked for the U.S. Army, and now she's certainly serving our country in a different capacity. So um, you, we're very proud to have you guys all as partners for USDA. Uh, just a reminder to please share your questions uh, or feedback via Twitter or submit the info uh, via G Plus event page, Twitter, YouTube, or Facebook using the hashtag NextGenAg, 
hashtag next G E N A G. Um, first, to start this off, I would like to kick a question over to the deputy. Um, really, just wondering what inspired you uh, in talking. The, what has inspired you the most in talking with military men and women? Um, but also, what do you see for uh, the future at USDA and really how to institute the work um, and institutionalize the work that you have started for years to come? I'll start with the first part of that question, and I see it in you too, Alexis. Um, is just that continued um, desire and passion to serve. Um, it's just amazing to me, folks who've made their careers, put their life on the line, have just even served for a few years, that they come out of the military and they still care passionately about our country and our freedoms and things that drove them to the military in the first place. They still want to serve and they want to give back. And it really is inspiring. I've not talked to a vet yet who has not made me just kind of well up like you did and tear up and just, you know, I just want to hug you and say thank you for your service because they want to continue to serve and they're very inspiring. I do hope that what we're doing at USDA, this kind of expanded cooperation with DOD and other partners with other NGOs and groups and folks represented here on the chat, that we can institutionalize what we do and we become kind of a household name or thought for vets who are, are transitioning and they think about as they're ending their military service. Um, those who may have a passion for outdoors, may have a passion for a continued passion for service, a way to give back, um, they want to do something different, whatever it might be that they know to go to USDA for some of those answers and that we can be a great resource um, for our military service personnel, especially as they transition. Um, no matter where they are in their career and they think about how can I do this, they know that USDA can help them. So. I hope this chat is just one thing um, that will um, provide some information um, to folks who are thinking about or maybe just, you know, still questioning, is this something I can do, should I do, that will always come to USDA. We want to be a partner. Well, thank you for that, Deputy. Um, now turning to some questions that we've received, um, I'm going to direct this one towards the veteran farmers first. Uh, what kinds of USDA programs do you use uh, and how have they helped you? If we'll start with that, maybe Colin, you want to take it, and then we could um, head to Dave. Yeah, sure, I'd love to. Uh, just real quick, the Farm Service Agency, uh, they've, they've helped us finance most of the operations on the farm, um, as well as the, uh, the NRCS um, with their cost share programs, and then the um, organic cost share program through the state of California, but it was, was funded by the USDA, if I understand it right. So those, I think, uh, off the top of my head, are the agencies that we work with uh, majority of Thank you. Dave? Great. Um, like Colin, I've taken advantage of the Natural Resource Conservation Service, known as NRCS. Um, and, and those in particular, the uh, we use the um, pollinator habitat. We had a uh, cost share with that. We had a, um, a transition program to organic production through cover cropping, 46 acres on our farm. And the third one, and perhaps one of the most important ones for us, was the funding for a seasonal high tunnel. Um, that's something that really puts a lot of capital right back, or I should say cash flow, right back into the business, and that's super important, and um, I really appreciate those programs. They were significantly important for our farm, as well as other many new farmers who I'm familiar with on the landscape. Thank you. Um, if I could, I would just like to add something real quick that the program that we have with Delaware Valley is actually a USDA grant. It's part of the Beginning Farmer Rancher Development Program, so this our entire partnership with DelVal was able to be funded by by USDA as well. And it, you know, I was just thinking about something uh, this the other day was how unique the industry of agriculture has a department at the federal level to service agricultural community. I can't think of any other industry, maybe energy, who has a department to service the the uh, uh, industry as a whole. So there's all kinds of programs um, that are available and and that are available to tap into. Sometimes it'd be easy, more difficult to, you don't know what you don't know, right? So if you don't know these programs, it's, it's hard to find them. So that can be a, a difficult thing in, some, in, in many cases. But um, you know, overall, I think the industry is pretty lucky to have a, a department to, to, service, to service us. Mm -hmm. One second. Are we back? <laughs> Maybe. We see ya. Okay, here we are. Yay. Sorry about that. A little technical difficulties more than uh, 
more than I could <laughs> withstand. So I was I'm glad we've got some IT. We keep on talking. Did you guys hear us? I'm sorry. Say that, Dave. We we kept on continuing with the question, the answers. Did you hear us? We couldn't hear you, so maybe you could uh, repeat your answer so the deputy and I could hear it. <laughs> okay. Well, re we'll recommend starting with Colin. Then he was the first up, and then I'll go to me, and then Justin. Yeah, just recap. I was just saying the uh, the Farm Service Agency who uh, who has financed many of our, our improvements here at the farm, uh, the NRCS with their cost share programs have also helped us make improvements on the farm. Um, as well as the organic cost share program that's run through the state, uh, I believe funded by the USDA. And I just also, I'm sorry? State of California. Right. And I also just wanted to uh, make a comment about the agriculture industry as a whole being somewhat unique in that we have a federal department that services the industry. Again, besides the energy department or energy, energy industry, I don't know any other uh, sector in the economy that has a, a federal department to uh, assist it along. So we're pretty fortunate in this industry to have those assistances. Excellent. Dave? Um, like Colin said, we, we've also on our farm, we've used a lot of the NRCS funding, Natural Resource Conservation Service. We've done three programs with them. We purchased a, uh, an 80 acre farm in Maryland. The first thing I wanted to do was convert it to organic production. It was coming out of uh, conventional commodity crops. And the program that helped us do that was the continuous cover cropping program through organic transi transition for three years. Um, that worked really well when you're trying to cover crop 46 acres. That, that's a lot for a new farmer to take on. Learning curve is steep, but that, that was helpful very much. Um, we also put some of the acreage into pollinator habitat. For uh, We planted native wildflowers and some grasses to attract beneficial insects. And then we also received funding from NRCS as a lot of new farmers and maybe current farmers with a, a seasonal high tunnel. Um, that, it's a really, really important boost in the arm for a new farmer to get some capital through that season extension, both in the winter months and the fall. And the last thing I'll mention, too, um, is that I'm a board member to an organization here in Maryland, Future Harvest CASA, Chesapeake Alliance for Sustainable Agriculture. And we have a really robust new, tra new farmer <laughs> training program, of which I'm a graduate. It began in 2009. I think we put 60 people on farms right now that are working in commercial agriculture. And that program has been funded for the past three years through a NIFA grant, and that was super important. So I appreciate the funding from USDA on that as well. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Um, I've got a question now for um, our farming organizations, for Marianne and Justin. What kind of experiences are you seeing that beginning farmers or ranchers are gaining through some of the training programs that you're working on? So I'll happily jump in. Um, we've been doing a series of trainings uh, since earlier this year, and we go from soup to nuts. We do a farming 101 to uh, an intermediate to an advanced level. And um, in the beginning uh, basic class, uh, it sort of lends to the other question. We uh, work very closely with USDA folks locally and provide um, an opportunity to network and understand the services that are out there. And so we have folks uh, learning about uh, the EQUIP program, for example, where they can get equipment at a, um, at a cost share with USDA. Um, we send them to the Agricultural Services Extension offices where they can get information and support uh, and we bring in USDA folks to actually introduce themselves and talk to the growers. And so um, that's our, our basics class. In our, in our intermediate class, we take them out in the field and we do field work and um, we provide information on all sorts of different things like legal issues and insurance. And then in our advanced class, they spend uh, several days working alongside mentor local growers in the field and so these classes are providing not just good information and networking but hands-on experience as well and, and uh, opportunity to have local mentors. Great, thanks. Justin? Okay, as far as the training programs that we have at, at Rodale, I'd just like to touch back real quick as far as how the USDA helped us. Actually our DelVal program was funded by a beginning farmer rancher development program grant and I'm actually heading out to the conference there next week out there in Reno. But so our entire, one of our initial pr training programs was entirely funded by the USDA through their grant. But the way the program works, they, they do a fair amount of classes there at Del Val. They have a couple classes up here. 
but they also do a lot of farm practicum. So there's definitely a lot of hands-on experience, probably almost about half of, of the training that they get. And the training that they get, you know, it, it covers, you know, a whole wide range, whether, you know, they get training on some beekeeping that we have here, to livestock, to greenhouse operations, to, you know, all types of organic focused related things. But some of the other things that I think are a little bit different, since we are a nonprofit here, we work a lot with grants. We also give a, a block of instruction on grants just themselves. How can you as a farmer apply to them? How can you them? Which ones do you qualify for, you know, at the federal level or at the state level? Just making sure that people are aware of what's out there because as Colin mentioned earlier, people don't know what they don't know. So just getting some of that information and some of that education out there to make them aware. Uh, one of the other things that we do, we, we partner with a, another local university with their MBA students and other finance and business majors to help our interns here in uh, the veterans to develop a business plan because at the end of the day all the training in the world is you know kind of worthless if you're not able to actually apply it so we want to make sure that you know the, the business is not what's going to hang them up that they have a, a sound business plan that's going to enable them to be successful and then you know to multiply you know themselves out. Uh, one of the other things we try to do is we partner with a lot of incubator farms or other farms that are in the area so when people finish their training you know they can start on their own their own couple acres but they're not totally left by themselves you know they have a, a mentoring built-in network there or you know we can help subsidize some of their additional training when when they move to the next step you know kind of taking the training wheels off but they're not necessarily all alone so it's you know kind of get making them gradually transition to you know hopefully getting into their own farm can I add something and just and, and listening to um, our two panelists and I think what I would say to folks listening is there's so many opportunities out there um, with NGOs and groups that are partnering with USDA that on the ground in your neighborhood in your community that can offer help and information uh, about USDA really from the very basics um, to the business plan and helping you get started with your land access to land and capital and so folks who may be thinking about this and worry you know, I don't know much about agriculture. I think you just heard a couple of really good examples of groups who have taken advantage of the tools of USDA and using those to be down on the grassroots level. We can't be everywhere, and that's one thing I want to stress. USDA can be the catalyst, can be the convener that brings people together, but it really does take groups like some of those represented here today and others across the country who are going to be in your community to help you learn more. Our local offices are there as well. Don't forget that is another tool and resource. But this really is a collaborative effort. And I, I thank the folks who are participating today in the work that they've done. It really helps us make what we talk about real for you and where you live. Great point. Thanks for that, Deputy. Um, I have a quite a, uh, question from Twitter. Um, and this can go towards uh, the veterans. Um, so Colin, Dave, and Justin. What is the biggest hurdle to entering into ag after the service? Personally, what did you find? I can start with that. This is David speaking. Um, I see three primary hurdles with new farmers, and I work with a lot of them, and being a new farmer and being a veteran, I think I am qualified to speak on some of it. I think the number one challenge is access to information. I'm talking specific details of how to farm. If we don't, a lot of us don't come from agricultural backgrounds, we need to learn how to, for instance, vegetables, how to set up irrigation, how to do weed control, pest management. And then the other key part, component I heard um, uh, Justin mention was the business. While the military lends itself extremely well to the, the nature of farming, which is a deputy said earlier, it's not a nine to five job. It's a lot of quick thinking on your feet. It's a lot of changing working environments and adaptability. And all those are really, really strong attributes that service members bring to, to the farming community, but the one thing we kind of still lack is we need to learn how to farm, and we probably don't have a lot of experience in the business, and if you want to get into this and you want to be a business owner, those kind of skills are very, very important. So number one is business, the, the, the training in my mind, and, then, and the second thing that comes to mind is access to capital. Um, the goal here is to become, a uh, if you're a, a, an entrepreneur or a small farmer, you want to become as profitable as quickly as, quickly as possible. It takes a fair amount of capital in my case, a small sustainable organic vegetable farm to get the thing up and running pretty quickly. So access to capital is very, very important. And the third thing that's important is um, is is, uh, is access to land. Um, but I think in that order, those are the three things as a military veteran or any new farmer, for instance, not necessarily a veteran, is going to find to be uh, most important to them. 
Great, thanks for that. Colin, do you want to t go next? Yeah, sure. I think uh, Dave hit the nail on the head on some pretty, uh, pretty important points. I think, you know, many people join the military not because they're, they're rich, you know what I mean? So uh, <laughs> when they're leaving the military, especially when they're, they're younger, they're one or two uh, enlistments. They're not, they're not resource rich. And so, you know, capitalizing the farms, I mean, that's one barrier to entry for, for all farms. It's, 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 it's expensive to get up and going. Either it's paying for land or you're paying for equipment or you're paying for both. Uh, and the other thing we find uh, with, with our students is that, um, and the panel mentioned this when we, we talked about why we got into the industry to begin with. We didn't say get rich, right? It was all lifestyle choices. Um, and, and that's why we really focus on the fundamentals of, of crop production, because that's what, we, that's what our focus is at the training program. Um, because those will, your, your, your fine details about your crop production methods will be dictated by the market and environment that you're operating in. So, Roughly half the program that that we provide is is about uh, crop production. The other half is really focused on the business aspects of it because again, most people want to get into this for, for lifestyle reasons. They don't want to be stuck behind a computer looking at spreadsheets, uh, you know, doing market data, figuring out distribution, making those customer relationships with with their buyers and so forth. But at at, at the end of the day, um, the farmer is the jack of all trade and a master of none. That includes from pest control to uh, understand market demands and, and future goals and so forth. I would actually say a farmer is a jack of all trades and a master of all. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're, not, we're not there yet. Okay. Uh, maybe Justin, if you want to, if, if you have anything to add. Sure. Uh, the other two, you know, Dave and, and Colin hit on most of the main points with, you know, it can be very capital intensive and, and the issues of land access. You know, we, we work with different people here to try to address that need. But one of the things that's kind of unique, and again, we, we're more of the, the organic niche here, is that a lot of people that get into organic farming, they, they like to do stuff on a smaller scale, you know, especially a lot of the veterans that I'm meeting. They, they have no desire to run you know, a 500-acre farm with you know, a giant monocrop. They tend you know, to want to have a farm that's anywhere between 5 and 25 acres, you know, depending if they're doing livestock or if they're more focused on, you know, greenhouse operations or just depending what they're focused on and just getting sure you know the, the the crop rotations down and some of the actual science that's that's behind all that stuff to make sure that you're doing what needs to be done at the right time so people people I think underestimate it a lot of times of how much science you know is really involved with doing farming properly and in the right way getting the most out of your soil great thanks for that Justin um, actually as a follow-up to that I would uh, like to ask Marianne so one thing I heard from all three of our veterans um, was that capital and access, using that capital for access to land or um, equipment, what are some of the things that you're doing within your program to help kind of veterans overcome that challenge? We work on that quite a bit, actually. Uh, we hear the same thing from everyone, from vets and non-vets, that some of the biggest challenges is getting a place to grow that's affordable because land access is very difficult and expensive and especially if you're an urban farmer like most of the folks we work with it's even more challenging there's small spaces uh, it's expensive and so we actually have created um, a land access manual to provide to the folks that go through training with us in ways to access land locally and nationally depending on where they end up uh, things like working with private owners in lease agreements working with land trust entities other nonprofit organizations, many states have a program where they actually own land and will lease it at a dollar an acre. Um, if you are able to show certain benchmarks, for example, able to pay your taxes within a couple of years. We here in New Orleans have a grow to own program with the city where as you reach certain standards over time, you essentially earn the land that you're growing on. And so this provides opportunities for potential farmers who might not have a lot of upfront capital. Um, and similarly, we do that with other resources, connecting growers to a uh, farm service agency, for example, where there are a number of free services and to extension agencies, um, agents, I should say, where there's a number of free services is very helpful. And, and everything we do is free as well, thanks to the USDA Beginning Farmer and Rancher Grant. I know you're hearing that a lot, but it really makes these services possible in uh, in other areas. 
That's great. Thanks, Marianne. I have a question from Google Plus specifically for the deputy, but first, I don't know if you want to kind of add about, we here at USD have kind of the same access to capital, access to land challenge, and we have been trying to take some steps to help veterans uh, um, and beginning farmers across the board um, meet those challenges, and I don't know if the deputy wants to touch on some of that. I think kind of our workhorse in this area is probably a microloan program. It's a cap at $50,000, but again, we're just talking about how a lot of times vets want to start small, and they want to enter into this, but that can help with land and other equipment costs that are so expensive, and we've seen such an uptick participation in our microloan program from veterans. Um, there's a lot of interest there. It's a streamlined process. Um, it's less paperwork. You can get the money quicker. Um, I, I would say that's the first program. There are others, but that's really what I'd call the workhorse. Yep. That's great. That's a great point. And that program is administrative to the Farm Service Agency. Uh, we've got 2,100 offices all over the country. So for the veterans out there who haven't heard about the microloan program, go into the Find Your County office um, and check that program out. They'll have tons of resources and information for you on how that program works. And if I can jump in, in, in regards to, if I can jump in, in regards to access to capital, um, it's not that the capital isn't there. I mean, I think we're in a unique time right now that there's uh, a lot of investment dollars moving into this space. And at the very basic level, there's a farm service agency whose lending programs are, are simply incredible. Uh, but there's a lot of investment dollars and private capital moving into this space. So it's really about can we take uh, an individual, even the military, train them up to the point that they feel comfortable approaching investors and so forth. We've had some success in that space, and that's something that we continue to build on. Um, and there's websites like Ag Funder, and you know, we're in a unique time where you can do uh, – uh, crowdfunding using private equity and, and so forth. So there's a lot of innovative uh, tools out there to, to capitalize a farm. But again, a lot of that comes with training, experience, and, and, and being able to uh, network and bring that all together. But also, our program is actually considered the precursor to the Farm Service Agency. So we're an approved a certified, certified borrower, trainer. borrower training in our six-week program with Cal Poly Pomona. So at the end of our program, many of our veterans and active duty go on to initiate their farms, which is really exciting. That really is. And I'll just say, you know, we have been looking at access to land and land tenure issues. As you look, as we talked earlier about the average age of the American farmer being 58, a lot of land is going to transfer hands. There are a lot of families who have already made a plan to have generations who are coming back to the farm, but a lot don't. And this is kind of a personal issue thing for me because my sister and I will, at one point will inherit a farm and we don't have kids of our own and we have careers somewhere else so we're just thinking about these issues so USDA and the secretary asked a group of us um, to bring in some outsiders um, from academic from the NGO world to really look at the land tenure land access issues um, and how do we make sure land is going to be available um, to pass down to folks who want to enter agriculture for the first time um, if they're not they grew up on a, on a farm, and you keep hearing from these veterans, just some of our guests who say, mm -hmm. "I just had this passion, but I didn't know anything about farming." So I think it's an issue we've got to address as as a um, as an industry. Um, USDA can be a part of that discussion. It's going to take a lot of different folks at the table to really think about how do we make sure this transition is done in a way that keeps land in agriculture and makes it available for those who do want to farm, whether it's just small areas or, or larger. Great, thanks, mm -hmm. deputy. Uh, as I said, I actually have a question for the deputy from Google+. Plus. Uh, we've heard from several of the um, panelists today about the farmers and ranchers returning, or veterans returning to farming and ranching are interested in maybe a more niche, smaller scale starting off. And a lot of that is maybe in urban areas. So just wondering what type of USDA programs are available for those um, in urban areas who are interested in getting back in, into agriculture. I think it's really good because I think the Kind of the initial thought, everyone thinks you have to live way down a dirt road like I did growing up um, to be a farmer, and that has just changed so much. And we're changing our attitude at USDA about how we deal with folks who want to farm in urban areas. And I have visited many of them. I've been to Mary Ann to see her in, in New Orleans on a very cold winter day in New Orleans, but um, warm heart and spirits were there at Mary Ann and seeing the great things they're doing with the rates bid and vertical farming. They had some chickens. They had you know, a little bit of livestock. It was interesting. I think what comes to mind is what's happening in Baltimore with vacant lots and kind of urban blight and the really encouragement from um, state and federal and local governments to help um, folks who 
want to come in and farm, veterans are often leading that charge and making sure that they see the kind of ability to that land and it's a vacant lot, it's producing food for a neighborhood or a food bank or a local farmer's market. Those things are all available and we're trying to serve that constituency much better, making sure our programs are available for those um, in urban areas and not just in rural areas. Um, I just met with a young farmer yesterday from Baltimore, um, a woman who did not grow up on a farm. She's not a veteran, but she's working with veterans there. So I think they're great stories. Um, all over the country in urban areas. One of the first farms um, I went to as deputy a couple of years ago was on the south side of Chicago to the Ag College and how they're working with veterans there with those um, college students in a very, very urban area. It used to be rural about a hundred years ago when this land was given to this, con to this high school and now it's right there in the middle of a city. So I think we have to think differently at USDA. We have to provide fl flexibility and working with folks in suburban and urban as well as rural areas. And what I can tell folks who are watching watching is that we want to. We see it as a very valued constituency. We want to make sure our tools work for you in any way that we can. We have a lot of that is our producer grants, our food hub um, efforts, specialty crops, working with organics. Um, our hoop houses is another very popular program through NRCS. If you can put up a hoop house and a hoop house, you know, just about anywhere. Maybe not your backyard, your neighbor's bank and playing, but in a lot of other places, you know, your own zoning and roles for your own community. We want to be there to help you use um, all the tools that we have and all the resources. And people are being creative. That's what's so exciting to me. They come to us with ideas to say, "I want to do this. I want to farm this way. I want to grow food this way." Um, I see really the industry growing and changing in USDA. Um, doing the same, trying to keep up with what's happening out there. Great. Thank you for that, Deputy. Um, I've got another question from online from Farm Answers, um, and this is for our farm uh, organizations. What types of educational materials need to be developed and shared to help veterans who want to farm? So maybe if there's a void some uh, someplace that um, you're seeing as veterans are coming in, and maybe it's certainly a role if there is for USDA. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can start with Justin. I think part of the the reasons was kind of addressed this week when I saw that memo that came out from the USDA about how they're getting into these transition assistance programs is just you don't know what you don't know. I think we, we've come across so many people like I didn't even know this program existed. And, you know, each of us are trying to advertise in our own ways, but you know, the fact that you guys, you know, as a branch of the government are, you know, reaching out to the service members as they're leaving just emphasizing the importance and the need for agriculture, I think that's a huge step in the right direction and I'm looking forward, you know, in the next, you know, three to six months to 12 months, I think we'll see a lot more participation or earlier joining into the different programs, you know, whether it's mine or any of the other panelists here or the many other programs that are out there as well. And just to, to add a few comments, I think, um, you know, somebody was asked me, where can I get info about uh, going into farming and leaving the military? I would just say, hey, I, we have this unique program. You guys should come out and try, and we'll, we'll train you up. Um, and I think every every here is probably going to say that, right? But uh, again, the challenge is, uh, you don't know, what you don't know. So it would be, you know, something like Google, where it takes an intense algorithm, you plug in a word, and it finds out what you're looking for. That would be ideal. And I don't know if something like that can exist. I mean, I'm just thinking out of the box here. But um, again, to streamline, have a a, a bottleneck where they have to go through that can divert these uh, these transition service members and vets to information they need will be useful and I don't know what that looks like but I think that's a, a, a link we're missing for uh, the transition service member as a whole whether it's they want to go into agriculture or they want to do whatever uh, they don't know where to start in many cases. TRS has a lot of holes uh, in their transition programs. Yeah. That's great, thank you. Um, I think we've got time for one more question and I am going to ask um, kind of all the panelists to actually answer this. And it's a question I think um, I'm struggling with or would really like your perspective is, what should we be doing collectively um, as farmer, veteran farmers and ranchers, as veteran farming organizations in USDA to really reach out to more veterans that we're not doing today? Maybe we'll just start down the line um, and we'll start with Dave. That's a great question. It's been talked about. There's an overload of information out there, but when you don't know what you don't know, it's a difficult path to take, right? Especially if we come from ag, we come from agriculture backgrounds. Um, 
So the journey for us, five years in, is really a start with, and the deputy talked about that a moment ago, was really a partnership with people who are retiring from the farming, but looking to not retire the farm. And that is by getting new blood to continue that enterprise. That is a really important uh, bridge that has to be built. I'm not sure exactly how that does, but I'm in that situation. I'm not far away from some of those upper age limits that were mentioned a few moments ago. Um, and I put a lot of heart and soul in our farm, and I'd like to be able to continue it on to the next generation when my wife and I decide to move on somebody else. So how does that work? To me, I have people that work on our farm, and we try to and hire we try to hire and inspire new people and we keep our eye focused for people that say look I, I think there might be something here for me and in my mind that would be a partnership a partnership as such where a, a new a new blood would partner with the the existing farmer and they would have an opportunity to sort of learn the ropes kind of like you would call an apprenticeship program I think that's a good way to do that because then you have access to the land, you have access to the capital, and you have more, most importantly access to the basic education. I think that's what a lot of us new farmers and veteran new farmers are struggle with is the information piece. We have all the drive, we have all the skills, maybe the business ones we can develop, but the basic components are there. We just need to get connected to experienced farmers. That's the piece I think that USDA and the, and the agencies can help put together. Great, thanks for that, Dave. Uh, next up, we'll go turn to Colin and Karen. Well, I was there. We were there uh, when the the, the undersecretary signed a, a memorandum of understanding with uh, Special Operations Command. I think that was an important step. I know there's an announcement today uh, that we read about. I don't know if we're supposed to bring that up or not. Maybe we'll let you guys talk about that. But the involvement with the uh, the TRS program, and whatnot. I think that's an important step as well. Um, you know, I think there's there's a bigger role for the VA here. You know, I, I was told that uh, during the World War II era. Uh, vets were able to use their GI Bill, not necessarily just to go to school, but for the farmers to get together and meet once a week, uh, you know, do some training, do some networking, and get that living income to offset some of the housing expenses so they can use uh, cash flow to cover operating costs. So I think that would be unique too. Again, I think that's beyond the uh, USDA space. But one thing I think is important to bring up about, and I forgot to bring this up initially when why vets uh, are, are attracted to agriculture as a whole. And I think that's because vets are, or farmers are on the um, front line of so many important issues that we're addressing today. Climate change, what we've been dealing with in California and Texas and so forth, farmers are on that front line. Immigration uh, and so many other issues that just uh, hit us home every day that the farmers are dealing with on the front lines. And it's that social impact. And again, I think that's why vets are, are attracted to this space. Lastly, my wife's telling me I got to uh, give some plugs. We have a new class coming up here in October. We'd like everybody to check out. Uh, we have a nice weekends class as well. So please go to archesacres.com and check it out. But, uh, uh, you know, I think the VA has a large role. I think the USDA has been uh, outgoing. I think it's time for uh, the VA to step up in this space a little bit and, uh, and start connecting some dots. Great. Thanks, Colin. Uh, Marianne? Yeah, I totally agree with that, um, with the VA piece especially. Uh, we have had a lot of success um, reaching out to veterans through universities and also um, through veterans organizations uh, locally and nationally when we know we're doing a special vets class or a class that would be advantageous to veterans. We specifically go out to the colleges um, where they might be taking classes or perhaps vets that are in school and ask all of the different vet organizations to please uh, advertise that we're doing these programs. And, and that's really how we've been super successful in getting the information out. Uh, and in addition to that, vets to vets. Folks uh, here in New Orleans especially tend to hang out together. They have uh, a similar frame of reference. They have a really good support system. And so folks who have come to our trainings and participated in different events that we host tell each other and every time we hold a class we, we get more and so I know that's a, a lot from the networking and the community talking to each other about the programs and the, the services that are being offered. Great, thanks. And again, last but not but least, uh, Justin? Yeah, just like everybody mentioned before, one of the key issues is, is partnering in that network that you feel like you're alone but you're really not. You just got to find a way to plug into the network that, that's you know in your regional area. I mean, I've come across people 
that you know participated in Archie's Acres. You know, the, the community is not necessarily as large you know as we think it is. There is a lot of overlap between people who've been in the, in the different circles. But it is kind of hard initially just to, to initially plug into that network. I think that's one of the, the challenges. And one thing I'll just add real quick is we actually have uh, one of the issues we have with our program is kind of the VA. And it's it's probably just a, you know one part of the government doesn't know what the other one's doing is that because we have a, a certificate program, they can be fairly scrutinized by the VA because unfor unfortunately there's a lot of you know colleges out there that prey upon veterans. But uh, it would be nice if we could get an exemption for you know programs that are specifically focused for veterans that we could market it that way because one of the challenges is the VA we're not allowed to market our program as specifically focused towards veterans because of you know the the bad programs that are out there but if but if we're you know getting a grant from the USDA obviously they they think our program is worthy so if we can get some kind of exemption written into the future that hey these people don't have to you know abide by the some of the other VA stipulations in regards to partnering with with different, you know, colleges and universities that that might be helpful. Great, thank you. Can I add, please? Um, just a, a little bit. We've talked a little bit about our kind of increased relationship with the Department of Defense and making sure that our materials are available at, at all transition classes. I was at one, as we mentioned earlier, on Monday at, at the Pentagon, which is kind of interesting. The Secretary plans to do those when he travels or other personnel want to participate um, in bases around the country, making sure that um, these our materials, our information are available. We're enhancing our website, make it easier, more information for veterans. I'm excited about that. Our own personnel in our local offices, Alexis, you mentioned the 2,000 plus offices we have, um, enhancing our partnerships as we talked over and over about. But really it is a lot of times it's word of mouth. You know, I mean, you, you talk to folks, what are you going to do when you're leaving? Um, you talk to your buddies, what are you doing now, and you're thinking about a career in agriculture, thinking about something um, to do with the land. Um, so I encourage the, our viewers um, to make sure that you're sharing the word as well. We're going to continue to be very aggressive. Um, the Farm Bill um, and the bill that was passed and signed in 2014 includes a new military liaison um, for USDA. We have, so we're going to have a, a person dedicated to this work with a whole team across the, um, our agency, which is quite large, as you know, we're hoping to improve our outreach, making sure our programs are targeted, the information is there. We partner with folks like Farm Credit. We partner with others who are in the communities who can offer service extension, the land-grant universities, and many of you who participated. So we just got to keep talking about this. Maybe we'll do this again in the future. We'll be talking about more specific things um, and questions and needs that we've learned from veterans. but. Um, the opportunity is there, and we just got to make sure we make those connections. Great, that's a great point. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, so that's all we have for questions, but I would like to turn to each of our panelists and give you one minute for uh, <laughs> parting words. Let's reverse that order and start with Justin this time. Okay, Rodale Institute. We have a lot of different programs available. You know, whether it's webinars or different seminars here, in addition to our internship programs and our other veteran-focused programs. Uh, RodaleInstitute.org. So we have our big apple fest this weekend. So if anybody wants to come pick apples, it's come Saturday, come earlier. You're not going to find many apples. So <laughs> you snooze, you lose. <laughs> Great. Uh, next up, Marianne. So we're doing a lot of similar things. It sounds like uh, as Rodale, uh, we offer free classes uh, every week in gardening, in hydroponics, aquaponics, and aquaculture. They're open to the public. We especially welcome vets and uh, underserved communities and women. We're trying to uh, build up the agricultural community uh, and reaching out to folks who perhaps traditionally haven't spent that much time farming. And we're at recirculatingfarms.org. If you have an interest, let us know. We're happy to talk to you wherever you are. And one quick thing I did want to mention, uh, we do a lot of urban agriculture since we're located in New Orleans. And one space that is amazing in urban agriculture is rooftops. So I just wanted to add that, that we're making space for agriculture in cities and we're using unique locations to do that. That's great. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, Colin and Karen. Yeah, so a plug for uh, for our training program in partnership with uh, Cal Poly, both certificated and accredited, so you can use your GI bills that come. We have a, a six-week 
Feed the Market Immersion Training Program plus a nights and weekends class, which is a 12-week program. Um, and it's, it's a value that's 17 quarter credits and so forth. And so uh, we're a certified borrower. We're at the Farm Service Agency. And uh, I think we get a lot of value um, out of the training and students come here. Lastly, I'd just like to uh, say thank you to the USDA because as the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have um, you know, not made the front lines, neither does veteran issues and taking care of the veterans when those guys came home, and which is a lot of times the most difficult type of work. It's not just putting on a tourniquet when it's immediately needed. It's that long-term care. Uh, I bet very few agencies are having uh, these type of discussions right now because it's not in the, not in the news anymore. So uh, thank you for, for uh, keeping you. it out there. Thanks, Colin. Uh, and last but not least, Dave. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, well, our farm is we're for prop we're a for-profit farm, um, but we all share the the same vision as everybody else here, which is, is get veterans on the landscape as well as new farms as well. It was mentioned earlier the the space is actually relatively small, and getting plugged into the network is really important. So for viewers out there. Um, you can get involved locally. It's not as hard as you might think. Um, it could be a Google search. To, you can put in keywords, sustainable farming. That usually will bring up U-Hits, organic farming. Um, I would say that's a great place to start. And before you know it, you're going to find a number of people in your local area that could be both training organizations. It could be a farm just like ours. And more than likely, they're willing to take a phone call or an email from someone going, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. Can, you, can I come out and see your operation? I would also say that most likely the USDA, the local farm, servancy, farm service agencies in someone's neighborhood, their network, they probably have a pulse on who that new veteran guy like me is out there and what they're up to. And they say, you might want to go talk to him. I think that's a great way to get plugged into the community. So the bottom line is reach out there. The community's not that big. And there are people out there that are willing to connect you to their farm and get you part of that program. And so thanks for all the support from the USDA. I appreciate it very much. Great. Thanks for that, Dave. Um, I will now turn to the deputy for any final uh, comments you may have. Just thanks. This is so exciting, and I just wanted to emphasize the commitment that USDA has to our veterans and helping them in the transition. We want to be there in any way that we can. Um, we have a great connect and great partnerships. Just need to con continue to grow that. So thank you to our panelists, and thank you to our viewers. Thank you for that. Um, Thank you to Dave, Colin, and Justin for your service, and thank you to all the, my fellow veterans out there watching and learning about the resources to them in agriculture. You can find out more information on USDA's programs and resources, as the deputy mentioned, at our website. It's www.usda.gov backslash veterans. And we want to continue to have this conversation with you, so tweet us um, at hashtag nextgenag. That's hashtag nextgenag. Thanks.